called Power in Numbers, Insight into State AG FTC Collaborations. Um, we thought it was a very uh, fitting topic because there's been a lot of dual agency enforcement that we've seen of late. You know, you've all kind of seen the headlines if you get the, uh, the uh, press releases from the FTC, if you sign up for their, their feed, they'll say, you know, FTC shuts down this company, FTC seizes all their assets, and we all see those headlines, and sometimes we wonder how can we make sure that we're not going to be part of those headlines, and how do we make sure that if we are part of those headlines, it's not as big of a deal as, <laughs> as these other companies have faced enforcement. So um, we have a very esteemed panel with us today, um, and they're gonna, we're going to each go through and introduce ourselves, but I'm going to let Mike start off with a humorous anecdote <laughs> to Thank get you. us started. Thank you. When I checked in this morning, everybody was so friendly at the registration desk. I mean this sincerely, so friendly and so helpful, I couldn't help myself. I told them, TGIM, at which time all the ladies and some guys that were there go, okay. I said, TGIM means thank goodness it's Monday. And that all successful people really do believe TGIM instead of TGIF. Because I told them this morning, I'm sharing it with you, I can't help myself here. You've got to do something to be something. I share this with my own kids back home. They said, Dad, give it a rest. But, 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 <laughs> yeah, but the point is, uh, destiny is not make house calls. If you don't grind, you don't shine. These are all one-liners I used at the front desk this morning, so I couldn't help but use them on you. You must be laborious before you can be glorious. <laughs> and the only serious thing I'll say about all that is I've been involved in sales all my life. So all those lines are sales lines, and the most serious one is sales is a transference of belief. So you're all involved in sales to a certain extent. We all are. We're lawyers, so we sell thoughts, ideas, and theories to a jury. We're all selling something. So my whole point on that one is Sales is a transfer of belief. Whatever you're selling, you got to believe in. And I'll start it off with a serious thought. Whatever you're doing, we're here today to talk about a culture of compliance. A culture of compliance. Figure out what the rules and the laws are and follow them, and that way you stay out of trouble. A culture of compliance should be the mindset that we approach the FTC with, the Attorney General's with, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Sometimes the law's a little bit hard to figure out. We're going to help you here today a little bit. But I used to say the law is legal instead of logical. The law is legal instead of logical. Not, not completely true. I mean, sometimes you need to, you know, come to a panel like this to help figure it out. But once you figured out the law, FTC, AG, state, federal, whatever it is, culture of compliance keeps you out of trouble. End of story. Thank you. Well, Mike, since you started off, why don't you, we'll, we'll work this way, introduce yourself and, and tell the room uh, about, a little bit about your background and why you're here. Well, now, now we get going again. I'll start telling more stories, you know. But no, no, seriously, ladies and gentlemen, I'm here because I believe in what everybody's doing. You're trying to get it right. And I'm a former attorney general in the state of Oklahoma. So I'm a former attorney general. My name is Mike Turpin. My slogan back in Oklahoma was, it's time for Turpin, it's Turpin time. So, so everybody said, that's a stupid slogan. I said, who cares? I won. I'm attorney general of the state of Oklahoma. And it worked out pretty good, folks. And I'm also a former district attorney. 10 years as the Muskogee County District Attorney. So I don't want to be silly about that. I spent 10 years as the Muskogee County District Attorney from the very town that Merle Hager sang the famous song about Okie from Muskogee. And I tell you that proudly, and I tell you boldly that I've been a District Attorney, the Attorney General, so I understand the compliance side of everything. Now I'm out in private practice, so, so I've seen everything from both sides at this point in my life, from public service and prosecution, now on the defense side, if you will, so to speak. I keep my clients out of hawk and out of jail. I mean, that's my point. I mean, I'm private practice now. Thank you. And thanks for being here. And thanks for having us. My name is Lori Kalani. Um, I'm the co-chair of uh, Cozen O'Connor State Attorney General Practice. And um, I appreciate you being here today. And I'm happy to be here. Um, uh, my background is that I, um, I was an in-house corporate attorney for about nine years with Dish Network. And prior to that, I worked at the FCC in government. and. Um, I left my in-house job to go into private practice to focus particularly on state attorneys general because when I was in-house, I was responsible for our compliance and working with state attorneys general and realized that they were critical to um, our success as a company and, and, and realized that there was really not um, a, a, a real uh, resource in the marketplace where there were lawyers out there who understood what state attorneys general were doing and what was 
uh, the pathway to success for working with these 50 very powerful people across the United States. And so um, I've been uh, out in private practice since 2010, but working with the state AGs much longer than that. And now I represent a, a wide range of industries, a, a lot of um, MLM companies and, and dietary supplement companies and tech companies. And, and I'm just happy to be here and share my thoughts with you today. So thank you. Well, if you only learn one thing from today's panel, you should learn the plural of state attorney general is state's attorney general, not state attorney generals. So if you only walk away with one thing, let it be that. So Lori has done her duty here and teaching you something new. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Rachel Hirsch. I'm an attorney at the Washington, D.C.-based law firm of IFRA Law. Uh, you may know us. We have the Power Booth Station here. Um, we're outside the exhibit hall today, and we've been at the show. It's probably our 13th show that we've done, and I've spoken on many panels about um, FTC compliance and litigation, and um, the purpose of today's panel is to really uh, talk about how you know the agencies collaborate together. Uh, I handle a lot of FTC cases, a lot of AG cases as well, and I, I have two right now that I'm handling, um, one in Illinois and one in Florida, and it's always, um, it's always interesting to understand why do these agencies decide to work together? Why is it that sometimes you'll see an FTC case by itself, and sometimes you'll see an AG case by itself. And then sometimes you'll see a group of AGs. Uh, is that plural? AGs is okay to say? Mm -hmm. Okay, the group of AGs working together with, with, with the FTC. And so there's been a lot of litigation, a lot of enforcement, a lot of CIGs this year that I've seen as well. And um, you know, it's been really a heavy year, I think, in terms of enforcement. There's a lot more press releases than you've ever seen. Last year was a bit quieter, which only means they were revving up their investigations for what was to come this year. Um, so we hope today's panel will give you some sort of insight as to you know, where, where the thinking is um, in terms of enforcement. So uh, the FTC is the three lawyers that everyone at the show either hears or does not want to hear or, or knows very well. And um, in 2014, Jessica Rich, who's the director of the Consumer Protection Bureau for the FTC, although not very, very much longer, right? right She's leaving. Um, she had a she made a speech before the National Attorney was NAC and NAG. NAG, which is the National Association of Attorney Generals. And she said, she or as some people like to say, National Association of Aspiring Governors. But we'll get to that. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. It's true. She described the FTC's mission statement uh, in front of these uh, states' attorney general, and she described the bread and butter, and, and you know another term for for bread is funny. The bread and butter mission of the FEC falls primarily into three categories. The first being fighting fraud, which is very broad based. You know, it could be telemarketing fraud, uh, uh, advertisement fraud, um, you know, debiting people's cards without their permission, anything that, that involves some aspect of deceit. Um, there is the stopping deceptive advertising, you know, the, the landers and the advertorials you see that say, lose 40 pounds in 40 days. I think if those were true, we'd all be a lot thinner as a population. Um, and then we have, of course, the protecting consumer privacy issues that comes up a lot with, you know, uh, children's privacy and tech companies and accessing your, your computers, accessing your, your personally identifiable information, um, and how they can help. Uh, so the FTC focuses on these three areas and making sure that um, consumers are protected in all three categories. And so, you know, the FTC has uh, various weapons in its arsenal to do that, to combat fraud. And um, there are some different statutes that they that they utilize uh, to do so. There's the, the Fair Credit Reporting Act. There is the uh, Fair Debt Collection Practices Act. Um, a lot of people who are calling to collect debt, the case I have actually right now is, uh, is a version of that under the FTC. It's a debt collection case. Then they have the the FTCA, which is the Federal Trade Commission Act, that's the popular Section 5A, which we'll get to about unfair and deceptive advertising practices. They have the uh, otherwise lesser known Graham Leach Bliley Act. They have Can Spam and the Trademark Act. Can Spam being for email marketers, making sure that they are uh, getting opted in info and opting out people who don't want to receive their emails. Um, they have the Telemarketing and Consumer Fraud and Abuse Act, very much in line with what the, uh, the TCPA is, which is the Telephone Consumer Protection Act. All those people calling your house and telling you to lower your interest rates. I think I get those calls about 30 times a day if I ever work from home, and it's my own fault for having a home phone. I probably should get rid of it. So <laughs> those are the people who are calling you and uh, those unwanted spam calls. 
and then they have the Truth and Lending Act uh, for the, the financial sector. So there's over 30 you know, acts and statutes that the, they use in, in their arsenal to, to combat fraud. And obviously, there are other agencies that share um, enforcement powers under these statutes. But these are the, the more popular ones you're going to see um, in the enforcement space. And, and when you see an FTC case, it's usually going to be under one of these various statutes. And as I said before, the most powerful weapon you're going to see <clears throat> from the FTC's arsenal is Section 5A of the uh, FTC Act, which prohibits unfair or deceptive acts or practices in or affecting commerce. It's a very, very broad, it's a very, very broad <laughs> statute, and it can mean a lot of different things. And so the, even the way it's worded, you know, um, in or affecting commerce, what does that mean? Does that mean you have to actually be selling the product, making the claims, or is it just putting something out there in the stream of commerce um, that will uh, that'll get you into trouble? Um, the, I, I'm involved in a case involving illegal short expiration dates on, on uh, gift cards, which is you know there's gift card laws that say you can't have expiration dates less than five years. And this company was a B2B company and not a B2C company, and they're being sued along with their co-defendant in a private consumer class action case. And the question is under the statute, which is very similar to the FTC Act, um, have they done something unfair in commerce? They, they didn't know consumers were going to get these gift cards. They just gave it to the other company to distribute as part of their consumer products. And when they distributed, it was up to them. And how did they distribute it? To whom they distributed it? So is this in or affecting commerce? Just putting something out there in the world and letting somebody else run with it. Uh, it's, it's a question. It's, it's not one that many people challenge. But I mean, obviously, if you are a B2B company and not a and, and eventually your product is going to become a B2C product, uh, it's an issue. Is that going to be something that affects commerce? So when we look at what constitutes unfair acts or practices, um, there are three different you know, factors that they typically look at. So the first one is um, an act or practice is unfair where it causes or is likely to cause substantial injury to the consumers. So it can be something that's minor, it has to be something that's widespread, a lot of people are going to be affected and harmed by it. Um, and it's interesting enough, even though they use the term substantial, if you look at the FTC case law, when you go to challenge an FTC enforcement action, they actually say that the FTC doesn't have to show you the number of people who are affected. They could just make the claim that, some, that the substantial injury has occurred, which kind of seems crazy, but that's how the FTC works, and we're going to talk a little bit more about their, their procedures or, or lack thereof in their cases and, and why they get away with, with what they do get away with. The second factor is cannot be reasonably avoided by consumers. Um, and the third is uh, is not outweighed by countervailing benefits to consumers or to competition. So you could say, you know, it's good for competition to have all these companies out there selling dietary supplements or um, you know making these claims. It's great to have you know people having options, but if their options are Things that are not real, you know, and all the dietary supplement companies are making claims that cannot be substantiated and likely harm consumers who are going to affect their diet and they're, uh, they're not going to exercise because they think taking these supplements are going to be the cure all for their for their weight loss problems. Um, then there are no countervailing benefits, as the FTC would see them. Um, and just lastly, when you want to, when they look to see that uh, an act is unfair, they can look at public policy. Uh, regulations or judicial de decisions. I mean, what does the what does the world, the universe of, of cases tell us about what constitutes unfair? So, you know, when you see an FTC case, you know, a lot of people don't fight back, and this is something we're going to talk about. And it's unfortunate because it sets a really bad precedent for future cases uh, because they'll say, well, look at these past cases. Um, they found um, that you know this was unfair and that this was deceptive. Well, maybe they did so because you took all their assets. And they they didn't have any money to put you back, and all they had to do was settle. So you've got this, this great case law for you, FTC, because you make it really hard for people to actually challenge what you're doing. Um, so more on that later, but something to keep in mind. And then, what constitutes deceptive? So this is interesting, and this comes down to what your, you know, kind of your ads and your and your and your landers look like. So an act or practice is deceptive where a representation, omission, or practice misleads or is likely to mislead the consumer. So it's not just what you say, it's what you don't say, right? So if, for instance, you're saying this this doctor has recommended this product, uh, let's say the product is a, um, 
we'll go back to my favorite example of a dietary supplement. But the doctor happens to be, you know, a, a DO and happens not to be a practice uh, dietitian or someone who has any any knowledge of the area of which he is speaking, then that is an that is an omission that's considered deceptive because you're not making the disclosure that you're supposed to make about the limitations of his qualifications. Um, the other thing you have to look at is a consumer's interpretation of their representation, omission, or practice, and whether it's considered reasonable under the circumstances. So Michael was making a very good point earlier about the law being legal and not logical. Um, is that, did I get it correct, Mike? Oh, yeah, that's yeah. exactly right. Yeah. Well, Sometimes the law is legal instead of logical. You just got to go figure it out. Well, well, the FTC is log. They try to be logical with the so. guidelines, but their consumers are not logical. So you have to think of what's the lowest common denominator of consumer that you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. Think about the, the most vulnerable people in society, the people, the the you know the least educated. That's what they consider to be reasonable consumer. Um, and so, with the FTC, what counts is the overall net impression that you leave with your with your advertisements. So again. Going back to the example, you don't talk about a doctor, but you sit, you have a picture of a person in a lab coat, right? And then there's a claim that's made. You're not saying he's a doctor. You're not saying anything about what he's claiming about the product. There's just a picture of someone in a lab coat. What's the overall net impression that a person's going to walk away with? Well, that there's some sort of medical science behind what I'm, what I'm claiming, right? And so the FTC will look at that and say, you know, that's, that's, that's misleading. That's an omission. That's a representation that, that's likely to deceive. And then the last point is the misleading representation, omission, or practice is material. It has to it has to influence your purchasing decision. It has to make a difference in how you view the product. That without it, you would not have bought the product. Or with or with you know. So if you hadn't seen a doctor on that page, right? Then you would have thought this is a bogus product. I'm never going to buy this. Um, but with it, you think, oh wow, okay, there maybe there's something to it, and that's going to influence your purchasing decision. So it has to be material. Um, so this is, we're going to talk about this, and then Lori and, and, and Mike are, are going to take a little bit over. So what happens when the FTC comes in? Well, the FTC has a lot of power. We talked about the statutes that they can enforce. The way they enforce it is through their statutory right to obtain a temporary restraining order, a TRO. A lot of times the way they do that is they do it ex parte, which means without the benefit of you being there. They will run off to the court, they will have their evidence, they will have their motions, they will have their affidavits, and they will say, judge, you need to sign off on this because we need to send notices to the banks to freeze all these people's money without them knowing it because we think there's a likelihood that they're going to dissipate their assets if they know about a TRO. So we're going to do this on the down low. So we're going to file everything under seal, we're going to get all our ducks in order, we're going to go raid their offices, and then we're going to slap them with a the TRO. And then, after we've done everything we can on our end, then they'll find out, and then they'll have their time in court. So judges oftentimes sign off on it. I don't know that we hear many times when judges don't sign off on it because that's not going to be public knowledge. They may say, go back and get some more evidence. But judges are usually going to sign off on it. And um, what happens then is that you have now, you go to your ATM, and you try to withdraw money. And you go, you know, what's going on? I don't understand what's happening. And then it could even be before you're served with papers. The FTC will release a press release that says, They've obtained a TRO to take down this company. I've had many times that I've reached out to folks and said, hey, did you see this? Can I help? And they're like, what are you talking about? I have no idea. How, did, how is it that you know about um, a, a case that was brought against me and, and I don't? And then slowly but surely, they'll try to you know, move money. They'll try to access their bank accounts. And they'll see that they're, they're shut out. And then what the FTC will do is they'll get a temporary uh, receiver that's appointed to the case. And receivers are fun. I always say they're fun because, and I tell clients, receivers can be your best friends or your worst enemies. And they are the people who are in charge now of your assets. They're in charge of your company's assets and your individual assets. They're all part of the receivership estate. And guess what? You know how they get paid? By taking money, chipping away money that's in the estate to pay for their fees. They submit reports and say, hey, judge, look at all the work I did in the last three months. I need to get paid. And, and the judge will sign off and say, OK, well, here's some, there's $800,000 in the estate. Your fees were $200,000. You can take your fees from the estate. And so that's how the receivers work. And so you want to really want to make sure that the receivers have all the correct information. Because once they start filing reports with the court, they're going to make all sorts of claims like, 
this is an illegal company, I don't see any way for it to run profitably. Their job technically is to run your company for you, right? But if they're saying your entire company is a scam, they're just gonna shut down the company, sell off all your assets, and have public auctions. And that's what happens in most of these asset freeze cases. Um, and so this is all happening before you've even gone to court. So you have no money, you don't have a lawyer probably, you have to find a lawyer. Lawyers don't work for free, as we know. <laughs> and um, you now have to go challenge the FTC at these boxes and boxes of paper they're gonna throw your way. They're gonna have affidavits, they're gonna have investigative reports, all this work they've been doing to collect on you. And you're, you're left holding the bag, what am I gonna do now? So unfortunately, a lot what a lot of people do is they capitulate. They say, okay, FTC, I'm not gonna fight you on the PI, I'll let the court issue a preliminary injunction and that'll be good for the, the entirety of the case until the case is settled. And the, the preliminary injunction will prohibit you, prohibit you from engaging in the activity of the complaint, and it will prohibit you from using your assets, um, it'll prohibit you from touching anything that's um, you know, tangentially even connected to the case. But you'll agree to that because you have no other choice, because you think what's gonna happen is you're gonna settle the case and the FTC, you'll capitulate, you'll stipulate to the preliminary injunction, you won't go to court and fight them, and you'll work towards settlement. Well, that is a mistake, folks, and I'll tell you why. Because the FTC works at its own pace, and they will settle when they are ready to settle. They will settle when they have all your financials in place. They will settle when they've taken their depositions. They will settle when they've done the discovery they need to do. They do not stop the litigation track of the case so you can talk settlement. They run parallel to each other. And so if your whole focus is to settle and you're not investing anything in your litigation track, it's not going to be a very pretty settlement when you go to the table and they say, okay, we want all your assets and we also want you to pay an additional $10 million. What have you done to challenge their evidence? And while it is the FTC's burden to prove their case, it does become your burden to try to get the PI to not issue. And so what you have to show is that the FTC is not going to uh, have success on the likelihood of the merits. There's no success. They're not going to succeed on the merits of the case. You have to attack all the evidence they've attached. You have to say that the balance of equities weighs in your favor. It's not fair what they're doing. Um, a lot of people don't do this because most likely the FTC has probably got some of what they said right. You know, some of your, your conduct probably is deceptive. It probably does violate the statutes that are cited in the complaint. But what people don't try to challenge is the breadth of the, the PI, the, the breadth of the asset freeze. They will not only see the assets are connected to the business at issue, they will seize all of your assets. And this is a concept that comes up a lot in criminal law. It's called substitute assets. When there's not enough assets in the criminal conduct to, to take care of the criminal, of, the, of, 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 of forfeiting enough of those assets to, to, to make restitution to, for the criminal behavior, they will seize other assets called substitute assets to make up for it. That's not something federal prosecutors can do. It's not something that's allowed in criminal law. For the FTC, that's allowed. There's some jurisdictions, like in the Florida 11th Circuit, that challenge that, but that is allowed. They can take all your assets because it's within the court's equitable power to hold all your assets. Even if those, so it's up to you now to go to the court and say, Judge, this money that's in this real estate holding was money I earned before I even started this bill, this this company. I have, you need to separate that. I should be able to use that money. A lot of people don't do that, and it's a mistake. And they don't do it because they don't have the money and they don't have the, the resources available to them to challenge it. But the PI hearing is your very, very first time that you can tell your narrative to the court. It's the first time the court's gonna hear from you. It's the first time they're gonna say, maybe they're not the scam artists that the FTC is claiming them to be. Well, you may be, but at least you'll get your story out there, right? You may very well be the scam artists they're saying, but at least you'll have your story out there. And it'll change the tone of settlement discussions. It'll change the tone of the case. Um, but again, you know, and I think Lori, uh, you, you can speak to this a little bit more. But um, this is, you know, this is this is the FTC at its best. They take all your money and leave you without any resources to to challenge what they're doing. And so they get all this great case law and all this great precedent because no one has, you know, the power, the time, the energy. And, and it's, a, it's a, and we'll talk about some case examples later on. And, talk about how long an FTC case can span. Um, it's tiring, and you need a lot of mental fortitude to get through these kind of cases. But if you can, and you have the energy, at least in the beginning, don't just capitulate. At least try to challenge some basis for their, for their PI. So 
with that lovely note, I'm going to turn it over to, to Lori and Mike, and they're going to talk a little bit about how these, the states uh, have their own versions of the, of the FTC Act. Yeah, and just to follow up on what Rachel said, I do think it's important to always challenge the government because they will they will throw everything they have and, and assume that you're not going to challenge. And, and oftentimes when you do challenge, you can make you know significant headway. Um, with respect to the mini FTC Act, every state has what I would call a UDAP statute of its own, which is an unfair, deceptive acts and practices statute that looks a lot like the FTC Act and may vary just slightly, but um, for our purposes, let's just assume there's a mini FTC Act. Um, and in many states, you don't need to show bad intent on behalf of the actor, and in many states, you don't need to prove any harm to consumers, and it's very broad, and, and what we're seeing nowadays is that AG sort of uh, cast a wide net and they bring any type of behavior in under the CDAP statute. And so I always say to my clients, if you sell anything in the state or even think about selling anything in any state, you're going to be subject to that UDAP statute. And, and again, very, very broad. Um, uh, in the states, AGs don't need to tell you why they're investigating you. Um, and as Rachel said, sometimes you open the New York Times and you read about yourself in the New York Times and then later that day you're served with a subpoena that will ask for documents that go back seven years and cover every aspect of your business and ask for personal information of every customer you've ever had. And, and we're often you know, we always are able to narrow those, but this is sort of where things start out, and it's, it paralyzes your business. Um, the FTC is in the business of freezing your assets. The AGs aren't aren't generally doing that on their own unless they're working with the FTC. But um, you know, the, the press is 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 a big problem. Obviously, um, some AGs tend to do that more than others. I would say, and we always try to work. We know all 50 state AGs, and, and I could sit here today. I'm I'm not going to do that especially with that camera there, but I can tell you which AGs are, are more likely to do that. But, you know, the goal is always um, it, it, putting words in Mike's mouth, know them before you need them. Um, you know, if you tend to have a dialogue with state attorneys general, and there are ways to do that, which we can talk about later on, they tend not to go to the press first. And if they know that you're a human being behind that business card and that you're employing people and that you're trying to generally do a good job, they're not going to go to the press. But um, they, you know, they do have a job to do, and so, and they've got this act that they can act under, and so they, they, it's pre-litigation discovery. You get this subpoena, and they want all kinds of information. And as Rachel said, it's, it's our job as your lawyer to fight back and to narrow that and to try to understand what an attorney general is looking for, and, and, and bring that down as much as possible to save the business money and expense and time, and, and just get to, you know, a narrow investigation or uh, exploration of, of what business practice they're looking at. Um, did I miss anything there, Mike? No. I would, I would agree about the human factor, Mike, and I think you do too. I think um, sometimes we forget that there are people behind these press releases, you know. Yeah. Let, let me jump in here. I, I'm just going to do a color commentary. Um, you guys have already heard this. At, at breakfast, I told them I was here to be on this panel, and I'm pleased to be here. But I also had my wife and daughter here with me so we could go to a Broadway show and my daughter's best friends starring in Cats. Okay, but, but I have a daughter and I think the best thing to happen for women in this civilization of ours is for men to have daughters because then a man looks at the world through his daughter's eyes. So I look at the world through Sarah's eyes. That makes me appreciate every woman in this whole civilization of ours that builds bridges and knocks down barriers for my little girl. She's 24 years old, so she's, not, she's a young lady. Okay, now that, that's, that's a... That's a twisted way for me to say these two women right here I mean I think you you can see that Rachel knows the FTC as well as anybody I know and and Lori I'm, I'm not trying to hustle business for anybody because they got all the business they need but Lori knows the world right here this lady knows the world of AGs better than any man any woman in this country I think so you're hearing from the best here and uh, I will say when it comes to AGs yes they're human beings I'm a former AG, so I want to get this in right now. You know, as an AG, I thought that I was Captain Courageous. As an AG, I thought I was Dudley Do-Right. Okay? As an AG, I thought I was the great protector of all my people. And the, the line the AGs use, and get used to it, you've heard it before, but the AGs love to say this, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. I mean, that's, that's the mantra of AGs when they're out speaking to the Rotary Club and the Lions Club and that sort of thing. So, 
all they want, most AGs, I'm speaking for them right now, is if I know, but all they want is, is what the FTC wants. They, they want, it's what you want. I mean, you want a satisfied customer, and they want a satisfied consumer. Consumer protection, consumer rights, consumers. So if you can work together with those various regulators, when the complaint comes and all that sort of thing, to get right, well, everybody can be satisfied and happy. On the other hand, these two ladies have already told you all about how bad it can get. When that complaint becomes bigger and bigger and badder and badder and more states are involved, the FTC is involved, et cetera, et cetera. There is a personal element that they're talking about. Personal contact alters opinions. I believe that. In your life, my life. And so it's, it's smart to have people that know the various, I'll just call them regulators. I mean, the FTC, the FTC commissioners, the FTC staff, and all the AGs. We, and to that point, let me just Go give you a bit of history. Um, I told you that I worked at Dish Network and I left my in-house job of nine years to go into private practice. And, and, and what prompted me to do that was we were constantly uh, we were constantly under investigation by state attorneys general. And one day I said, you know, this just isn't right. These attorneys general don't understand what we do to make our consumers happy. We had this we had this disagreement about how customers would return their satellite box when they were no longer wanting to be a customer of Dish Network. And and customers would complain, but the, the regulators didn't understand the, the steps that we took to get those boxes back to the company and so they were investigating us and we're talking about multi-million dollar investigations and so I said to my boss I'm going to go to every state I'm going to talk to every attorney general because every one of them has customers in their state and it took me two years and I went to every state in the country and what I learned was that they all had these varied opinions and they all cared about different things. Most of them cared about those boxes, but some of them cared about identity theft and some cared about um, service to rural parts of their state of genuine concern and some cared about billing issues and some cared about making sure that ethnic communities could understand the foreign language on their bill. And I wrote all that down, right? And I figured it out. And when I finished after two years, I said, that's when I said, boy, there's some real magic here. These people are human, and they have different concerns in their different states, and I'm going to figure this out for other companies, and that's what I did. And so Mike's absolutely right that there's, you know, there's a certain common element. They all want to help their consumers, and fraud is fraud, and, and so there's that sort of common underlying theme. But they are humans, and there is a way to sort of blunt that blow when you're out there doing business and, and trying to run your business and trying to make sure that you're not, you know, a victim of, of sort of, sort of uh, what I would say government abuse, and I, and I don't use that term lightly, but trying to sort of blunt that and, and get on with your business. Um, on this slide, um, this is sort of self-explanatory. You know, these AGs, they are a moving force behind multi-state investigations, and that would be when more than one state forms um, a coalition with other states. So you'll read about those headlines, you know, 50 state uh, mortgage settlement, um, 50 states plus the FTC uh, band together to go after the cancer charities, which we'll talk about as one of our case studies. Um, they, they get together and pool their resources, and so that becomes you know much more um, powerful as far as um, the AG's perspective. They can do a lot more investigating when they pool their resources. Um, if we look at the next slide, this is just a little bit about the politics, and I think this is important because AGs are elected in 43 states and now also the District of Columbia. That's as of 2014, and why is that important? That's important because um, they are answering to their constituents and then they're answering to their voters. And so it becomes ever more important, and this may be a little jaded, but um, they want to help their consumers. They, they're, they're charged with protecting consumers, and it becomes more important when those consumers are also the people that are voting for them. And, and that matters because if they're getting complaints in the mail or on an app, and by the way, we were just looking at the apps on my phone today, attorneys general are now putting together apps where you can complain right from your phone. You can actually take a picture of an offending ad and send it to an attorney general's office. I mean, that's Don't take pretty, any pictures here today. But, right. but, yeah. but, that, but that's pretty crazy, right? And, and AGs will tell us that after they get five ads or five complaints about one company, they open an investigation, right? So, so now if 
if they if they know that voters are complaining to them, they have a duty. They already did, but they have more of a duty to go out after those companies and open an investigation and do something about it. And so I think the politics do play in. Um, you know, we tend to see, believe it or not, those those attorneys general in those five states where they're appointed by the governors, they tend to be slightly less active. And I'm not sure if that's just coincidental or not, but I think the politics matter. Um, and you know. It, AG's races are getting more competitive. I, I mentioned earlier, people say NAG is the National Association of Aspiring Governors. I didn't make that up. Um, that's what people really say. And I think that um, as they become more political and step to higher offices, I mean, Bill Clinton was an attorney general. There's currently six governors that were attorneys general. I think as those offices become more high profile, you're going to see AG's open more investigations and become more active because that's a way to prove that they are you know, sort of offices of the people. And they believe the number one function of government is the protection of its people. That's what they believe. I've already told you the great protector, but they believe that. However, based on what she just said, never forget the fact that they are human beings. She went to all 50 states with that initiative she talked about a while ago. And hear me now, believe me later. Hear me now, believe me later. A man's judgment, a woman's judgment is no better than their information. Their judgment's no better than their information. It, it, it's your responsibility oftentimes to give them information so they know both sides of every issue, if not more than both sides. So, so, so briefly, Gloria, you want yeah. to touch on what the, the NAAG is? Yes, so um, NAG is the association uh, where all the AGs come together, and their mission is noted up there. Um, they, it's to facilitate the interaction among the AGs. They come together for several meetings during the year, and they, you know, this is a nonpartisan group, so they put the politics aside. They have uh, several subcommittees and standing committees, and, and they work across state lines and one of the uh, most active subcommittees that they have or standing committees would be the Consumer Protection Committee and they meet several times a year and that's where they tend to sit and discuss um, initiatives and, and come up with these multi-state um, uh, investigations that they're going to... Uh, 1998, we went after four major tobacco companies. We all heard about that. 1998, the Master Settlement Agreement, $200 billion. I said that with a B. That's when they started getting more and more authority and power. They came together, they did what they did, and now you see Volkswagen most recently for that. You mentioned the mortgage settlement. So they're, they're, they need to be in your business plan. When you're talking about business, law, government relations. Strategy. Yeah. And then something we'll talk about a little bit more later is also, you know, we're always talking about the complaints, getting five complaints triggers, you know, an investigation. I have law clients who, who tell me, you know, I only have a few complaints here and there, but on the larger scale, I'm getting a lot of, you know, it's not just my clients, I hear this all the time, but I'm getting a lot of positive feedback. But if you have three complaints from one state, that's a lot of complaints to have. I don't care what the volume of your sales are, it's, it's not really in proportion to the volume of your sales. It's three complaints, you, you really be, you need to be able to look out for that state coming after you, some sort of you know, CID or some sort of enforcement action. Um, you know, and, and we talked about, you know, these joint investigations that they have. I mean, they, they look at robocalls, which is a, a huge area. They have, you know, this timeshare resale fraud, weight loss, mortgage, these, these biz op scams. And yes, there are people who still do biz ops. So I, I always question, like, are there still people out there who are offering biz ops <laughs> as, a, as a vertical? But yes, there are. Um, you know, and they, and, they group, and they get together for education and outreach. They have um, different special weeks they put together, like National Consumer Protection Week. Military Consumer Protection Week, which is very important for vets, you know, making sure that and seniors, seniors, right, seniors, seniors as well, big area, and, and for vets also, they look, they, you know, make sure that you're not, they're not getting ripped off, that their veterans, their, their benefits are not getting poached, and that these for-profit colleges who are marketing to, you know, people coming out of the military are not, you know, ripping them off or or making claims that they can't substantiate. I think the most important thing is, and we'll focus on this, and we're going to get to this a little bit more, is the sharing of consumer complaints. So we talked about the fact that you know you'll get AG complaints, and the AGs sometimes will forward you the complaint and say, "Hey, this consumer is complaining about the fact that you didn't give him a refund. Please respond in writing within 10 days of this letter." So you'll usually respond and say, "Okay, you know, we take these complaints very seriously. We're very sorry. Here's his money back." I mean, that's probably something you should have done before the complaint came out, like give him a $16 back. Don't pay the attorney $500 an hour to write that, that letter for you. Um, but, you know, that's usually a response and you don't hear back and, you know, and you move on with your life until the next complaint. You don't get that same kind of insight into 
complaints are going to the FTC. The FTC has something called the Sentinel database, and probably the first time you're going to see the, the, the volume of complaints against your company is in, in an enforcement action. Is in the FTC, the investigator will attach or reference 500, 600 complaints. And you're going to say, where did those come from? I have no knowledge of that. Well, guess what? It's not, up to, it's not you know, you, you don't have a right to see those, those, those complaints. Just because you're running a business, you would think you have a right to see what consumers are complaining about. But that's not public. That's not a public database. It's a database that the FTC shares, and they share it with, law, the state, enforcement. with law enforcement and state agencies. And then probably the first time, if ever, you get to see it is when you're, you're being sued or your offices are being raided and you're looking through these affidavits. And well, I'll just add one more thing. It, not all AG's offices forward complaints anymore either. I was talking to Texas about a year ago, and they said, well, we just don't have the resources anymore, so we don't forward complaints. And I said, well, why do you accept complaints? And they said, well, that helps us decide who to investigate. So we you know, take the complaints in, and I said, so what do you tell consumers? Oh, we just tell consumers that, you know, we're thank you for the complaint and we'll take it under consideration. They said, we just don't have resources. So, you know, once we get five, we decide we'll investigate a company. So so that's very scary, but not all not all states are forwarding complaints anymore. So, so it's more like the FTC. In my office, it was automobile complaints. Doesn't affect any of you, but people weren't happy with their cars, lemon laws, all that. So, man, we sent letters to every automobile dealer in the whole state when we had a complaint. Well, our theory was when they begin to feel the heat, they start to see the light. A letter from the attorney general. Not, not even a subpoena, not even a CID, just a letter from the attorney general. Yeah. You know what? We made a lot of customers happy. And we, and we got along with the car dealers, too. We were just trying to bring everybody together, you know, to a certain extent. Go ahead. Just make sure when you get those letters, you actually respond to them. Yeah. I mean, even if you need and a little bit more them. time, track them, track respond. Them. You know, they keep track of the fact that if you, you know, you're going to see your responses in when you get a preliminary injunction. The FEC will have all those responses. They'll say, see, I told you this person runs this company because, look, their signature is on these letters saying, hey, we're going to refund this customer or, hey, we didn't do what they're accusing us of doing. Um, they're going to have all them. And they're going to have the fact that you didn't respond to them as well. Keep track of your good letters, too. You right. may have a chance to take those in. Yeah. Try yeah. to explain yeah. one bad letter. Yeah. That's, okay, that's right. Um, so we were just talking about what the triggers are for an investigation. So I, I, Lori and Mike talked about the consumer complaints obviously are triggers. Um, there may just be an industry-wide sweep. They may be looking at a specific area they want to target. Um, you know, a few years ago, there was those spam text messengers who were sending, you know, win a $100 Walmart gift card. I had one of those cases in Texas. Uh, and, you know, there was an industry-wide sweep. They just wanted to take down the entire industry. And so they went after them not because of the necessarily the number of complaints that were against them, but because that's, that was an important initiative for them at the time. Um, competitors, don't be surprised if you if your competitors call these uh, enforcement agencies and say, hey, you need to look into this person's business. I had that scenario, not necessarily in an FTC case, but in an SEC, CFTC case, where the competitor actually had an affidavit saying, they're not licensed to do business in the US. You know how we know this? Because we're the only company that's licensed in the US to do this kind of business. And um, you know, there's oftentimes you're going to see letters from competitors. Um, there's also monitoring and surf days. Sometimes the FTC does have resources where they have people surfing the net to see what is out there. What are people saying? What are people claiming? And you know, they're going to find those those ads that people take pictures of it and send to the uh, Florida AG or whoever else they're complaining to. And then oftentimes there's you know the media stories, right? And then Lori, can, you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, I, and and the AGs as consumers, right? I mean, AGs often say, oh, I opened a, an investigation because I got screwed by the car rental company, or I had a bad experience with the. A cell phone insurance company or something along those lines. So uh, then, then you're in real trouble. Then you're in real oh, trouble. But, my wife, an right, AG, right. My wife, a child. Oh my god. They had a bad experience, and then they just they come to work and say, "Send a subpoena," and, and that's that. Um, so and we have a lot of experiences like that. But it's media stories. And what we didn't mention earlier is, you know, so these AGs are elected, and there's term limits, and they come and go, and and um, but. The staff stays forever, and the staff just reads the paper, and they read the FTC's headlines, and they read. So if they weren't involved in an FTC investigation with the FTC, sometimes they open their own follow-up investigation. They read the class action lawsuits, right? They read what the class action, the trial bar is doing, and sometimes they say those trial bar guys, they're just in it for the money. You know, they are they're in and out, and so we need to go in and really clean up this industry. Um, so those staff people are are really true believers. In in, in the cause, and so they're reading and reading and reading and watching the news, and so 
you know, you have to assume if you're reading about it, so are, so are these attorneys general, right? Yeah, they don't operate in a vacuum. They're, they're there like everybody else. I mean, they see a headline, they react to it. I mean, there's no question. I mean, they, they may go start an inquiry based on a headline. Oklahoma City recently, five minutes. Student loan, a college, went out of business. Everybody was stuck having to pay the money, but they're not going to get a degree. Think about that. Attorney General sees the headline, immediately starts an investigation. Scott Pruitt did. But, but it's obvious. They, they don't work in a vacuum. Go ahead. I think we have a little bit more time to start late. So, let me keep going. But, um, so, I think that's what I Okay, that's fine. We're yeah, gonna yeah, yeah. we're gonna speed through the rest of this. So yeah. obviously, Which there's a rise in collaborations be? because there's a a, sh uh, a pooling of resources and you know information sharing and you know, the AGs have this broad investigative authority that maybe the FTC doesn't have. They also have these civil penalties under state law that are available to them that the FTC doesn't have. Um, there's some case studies here that we'll just talk about real quickly. Um, there's the the Lean Spa Leads Click uh, case. Um, this is a floor, uh, FTC Connecticut. AG case. Um, Lean Spa settled the, the, the network who was, uh, or the, the affiliates who were accused of making these fake news ads were actually got summary judgment issued against them and they're appealing that right now for about, I think it was a tune of, uh, I want to say it was uh, $11.9 million. So they're obviously appealing that at a time. Um, but, you know, this is one example of what we see where the, the AG and the FTC collaborated. Um, another one is these, you know, these tech support cases. Um, this was a, a case involving Boost Software. This was in Florida. Um, and I think a lot of these cases settle on what's called an ability to pay basis. So they'll get these huge judgments against them. In this case, the, they settled for $37 million. They only actually paid out of pocket um, $236,000 because they submitted financial disclosure saying, hey, I don't have money. But so what the FCC does is, as long as you're being truthful in your in your financial disclosures, they'll, they'll issue this judgment against you, but they'll suspend the bulk of it, um, and they'll only make you pay you know a certain amount based on your financial ability. If they ever find out that you were lying on your financial disclosures, of course, they can always probably reopen and reinitiate and make you um, liable for the rest of the money. Um, I don't know that there's been too many instances that we've seen that happen, so don't lie on your financials. Um, we have the, the cancer charities that we talked about earlier. Those, uh, you know, the big 50-state, multi-state investigation. Um, and then we also have uh, the T-Mobile, the, the cramming cases. Those are huge. And uh, we had the, uh, uh, some, again, plus, uh, supplement makers. And this was a main FTC case. I think the importance of these cases is um, not only do we see you know, large settlements and, and, and collaboration between the FTC and the state AGs, but it also gives us some insight into how long these cases span. I just went on a, a pacer last night just to see how long these cases went off for. The Lance Mock case started in 2011. Um, the final summary judgment was in 2015. I mean, they amended the complaint, they added new parties, but that's how long that case span for. The Boost Software case was a little bit more in line with um, how long you'll see. It was November 2014 until February 2016. You're usually going to see a span between a year and a year and a half of these cases stand for. So it's a lot, a lot of time, especially if your assets have been frozen and you don't have money. It's a lot of uh, headache and a lot of uh, energy that's going to take um, to, to, to deal with this all until you get to the finish point. But that's, you know, the typical, the typical span of a, a lifetime span of a case is going to be between, you know, a year and a year and a half. Um, so, you know, we have these, these, these lessons is when you get, a, you know, an investigation from a, a, an AG's office, make sure you respond, or an FTC, make sure you respond, you respond widely. Um, make sure you reevaluate the policies that you have in place within your company and that you are, you know, if your refund policy is what's triggering these complaints, then maybe you need to revisit your refund policy and tell your customer service people that if someone calls a refund, that they should actually refund the person. That also involves a lot of training. A lot of agents need to be trained in how to deal with customers, right? That's the, the customers are, you know, that's your, that's the way you're going to make money and that's the way you're going to lose money. So make sure that they're trained. Obviously monitor the, um, the complaints that are coming in and respond to them in a timely fashion and make sure that, you know, you're, you're doing the quality assurance that you need to do. And then as, as Lauren and as uh, Mike said, maintain records, especially good records. If you have good feedback from your customers, it's always positive and you should always keep track of those as well. Um, these are kind of, I just, given the time, we're going to go through this a little quickly. Uh, 
Obviously, when I see ID issues, don't try to respond to it yourself. I had someone call me who said, I'm just going to respond to this myself. It was an FTCC ID. I said, okay, go up with that. Um, I know you're strapped for cash, but I, don't, I wouldn't recommend that, especially when, you know, you don't realize what you're producing may be something, you may not, you may think it's an innocuous thing, but it actually may be very telling. The FTC may, it may open the doors to further investigation or further inquiry. Um, and make sure you always put a litigation hold on your documents when you get a CID. Don't start having your employees delete stuff or, or shred things. That's, that's always a big no-no, and that's going to be a sign that you're trying to hide something for sure. Um, and so obviously read the CID carefully. Make sure that you preserve your documents. Go to the AG, go to the FTC and negotiate. What is it you're looking for? That's the step most people forget to ask, right? Give them a call, get on the phone and say. Oh yeah, yeah. I always hear, I'm going to try to just stay out of the radar. Right? We hear that all the time and, and I always say, if you're selling your goods in all 50 states or even two states, you are not out of the radar. They know you're there because they are the consumer as well. So there is no such thing as staying out of the radar if you have a presence online. So don't fool yourself. There is no such thing. And there are meet and confer requirements the FTC has, especially, you know, you have to meet and confer within 14 days. This is the scope of what you're going to produce and the objections you may have. Um, so you, you, may, you want to make sure to give them the call. Maintain confidentiality. A lot of people forget that you can actually try to negotiate, you know, some sort of protective order for the documents that you are producing. These CIDs are all private investigations. They don't turn public until, if and until a complaint is filed. Or let's say you decide to go to court to, to quash the, the CID or try to, to narrow its scope. Well, what you've done now is while you're challenging the scope of it, you've now made what was once a private investigation a public, uh, a public investigation. Um, make sure you're producing carefully. Read the question that's asked. Sometimes you, you, people overproduce. They're not asking that question. You have to, or they are asking that question and you're not producing what they've asked for. And then, and choose wisely. Always make sure that you are well represented and uh, you have someone advocating on, on your behalf. Um, so the settlements can look like, you know, you can have a pre-litigation settlement where before the FTC files a complaint, um, they, they may come to you with a CID and you can settle then, or obviously post-litigation. The timing of it is important because you know it, it dictates whether you know there's this TRO in place and these asset freezes in place. The kind of relief they're going to get are, is money, and sometimes it's injunctive. Like we were just talking earlier about how state AGs really just want you to change your behavior. And best so, practices. Best practices. Making sure that you're not doing the behavior that was subject to the investigation, and sometimes that may be enough. Maybe you don't have to pay the money. And then you know, making sure you have solid settlement documents in place that actually cover the breadth of the scope of the uh, investigation that you're signing off with both agencies at the same time, um, and so that you know it's a, it's a protect you against uh, private class actions to the best of your ability. So with that, so I know we we kind of sped through the last few slides. Sorry, because of the setup. We'll leave it to questions. Does anyone have any any questions? Um, can you talk a little bit about advertorial compliance in terms of like. Um, advertorial, like yeah. editorial written by the company in terms of, I see some at the top sometimes it says sponsored content, sometimes it's advertorial, sometimes there's stuff on the right, at the bottom, on mobile, it's usually all at the bottom. What's, what, what, what are you supposed to do there? Okay, so the question here was um, advertorial content and how can you be, I guess, compliant with yeah, it under the guidelines. So that's a really big topic and I don't know that we have all the time to talk yeah. about it, but I'll, I'll just tell you, I'll tell you this. Make sure your disclosures that you make are clear and conspicuous. That's the standard by which the FTC judges judges your advertorials by. So as long as it's clear, I mean, there's, it doesn't have to be necessarily sometimes the right-hand side versus the left-hand side. As long as it's clear that this is a paid ad, that this is not supposed to be a new site, this is not supposed to be an independent source of information about this product, that you know you have some sort of affiliation to the advertiser who's paying you for for making these you know bringing this advertorial, um, and you've done it in in a, in a way that's conspicuous that the consumer can see it and they see it right away. And it's not something that they have to scroll down the page and, and look at these you know fine points, fine print, and see you know that this is an advertorial. Um, I guess in a nutshell to answer that question because it's it's very broad. Um, though that's the standard by which I would judge how you how you. Uh, market your advertorials. So if it is hosted on the same domain as the product, do you think that's the same thing? Because obviously it's the same company. Do you know what I mean? And, and the question was, if it's hosted on the same domain as the product, is it is it clear? It's a, I guess it's going to be very fact specific, very case specific. It depends on the, the situation. It may not always be clear. Again, remember, consumers you're dealing with are not necessarily 
the, the reasonable standard for them is going to be very different from what we would think a normal reasonable person would be. So if you're targeting the, the elderly, the poor, the, 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 the overweight, or the unhealthy, whatever, you have to judge it by what their standard would be. Thank you. Anything else? Uh, yes. so if you're working with an affiliate who makes a false claim uh, of your products and you weren't aware of it, uh, are you still liable? Is that you see exactly that as a kind of reason why you should be liable? The question is if you're working with an affiliate and they claim that you're not aware of about your product, are you still liable? As an advertiser, you're always higher up on the, on the food chain, right? So whatever's said about your product, you are responsible for, for monitoring what's said about your product. It may be a way of mitigating your exposure once you're, you're pulled into like a litigation or an enforcement action. Um, and you, you, know, you may say that it was really the affiliate who did this and it wasn't us and we didn't sanction this behavior. And then once we found out, we, we stopped them from doing so, but ultimately, when you put a product in, into commerce, it's your responsibility to make sure any claim that's being made about that product is, is truthful and fair. Very quickly, because I know we got to close, but, but early in the 20th century, do you kind of remember Teddy Roosevelt? The whole idea of Teddy Roosevelt, the Rough Riders, all that. Teddy Roosevelt became popular for trust busting. Well, along came a guy named Louis Brandeis. He was a private attorney, but he was going after all these steel trusts and steel monopolies. And 1912, Woodrow Wilson was elected president. He wished for Louis Brandeis, the lawyer that was going out there doing the trust busting like the previous president had, Teddy Roosevelt, a private attorney. He, they called him the people's lawyer. And Woodrow Wilson asked Louis Brandeis to give him a solution, not just for monopolies, but for consumers with everyday problems. And Louis Brandeis came up with the FTC. So he's the father of the FTC. I want to give you a little bit of background there. The whole idea is the roof of the law covers us all, right? It protects everybody, but also applies to everybody at the highest level. Last line, Churchill said, Churchill said, when it comes to free enterprise, that's what you're in. You're in business. You should be proud of that fact. You're in free enterprise. But what's the balance between free enterprise and the government? Business and the regulators. And Winston Churchill, I think, said it best. He said that, a lot of people see free enterprise as a cow, you just milk dry and use it up. Other people see free enterprise as a lion, you chase through the jungle and you shoot it, you kill it, and you eat it. And Churchill said, I see free enterprise as a strong and sturdy horse that pulls behind it the cart, the cart of democracy. Our whole system of government depends on a flourishing free enterprise system, which you're all a part of. So, so thank you and congratulations for being in business. Now how we balance those two, business and government is going to be a challenge for the next 240 years because right now we're 240 years old. We're still a young experiment in democracy. But congratulations for being here and being in business in this great country. Thank you, everyone.